command line programs can have a direct impact on the creation of graphical user interfaces. The options available to us to improve user interface code often follows from working out useful software code patterns involving data. Data is one area where command line programs shine as evidenced by the preponderance of command line programs in Linux operating systems that shuttle data from one command line program to another. A command line program is often less entangled means to shape code into a more refined form. And that's how we will approach it today. So the line of code that I highlighted is the GTK notebook uh, function for adding a tab page. That is not unlike the code that is involved in automatically updating RSS feeds. And indeed, through this process, we will process RSS feeds on the command line in a command line program and recognize a code pattern that has a 100% use in the user interface program. This is the bake file for the RSS IO test program we discussed previously. And in the previous segment, we talked about ARG table as an addition to the command line programs we're discussing. ARG table allows us to better structure command line programs and in this case has significantly elevated the capabilities of this command line program in terms of how code is defined. So when we compile our table into the application we're going to bake it in directly and allow the C++ compilers and linkers to Actually, there's no C++ linker, but anyway, to allow the C++ compiler and the system linker to optimize our use of our table in the code. So we're going to generate an our table object file and directly use that object file in the code. And then once we retrieve that object code, back to the local desktop environment we're going to ensure that the R table library that's generated is not also retrieved and downloaded that way we can ensure that the program is compiling the way in which we intend it's running the way in which we intend if you see the directory listing you'll notice that R table is way at the top as far as the object um, files. When we build it, um, we have our table, the our table object file automatically included. The our table lib our table dot a file we are not interested in. We're going to leave that as is. Our table itself is a C library and so we compile it separately and use different parameters for it than for the main application. So Arc Table is compiled fully optimized using the C compiler, using the latest C standard, and then its resultant object file is included into a program that's compiled for debugging, for maximum debugging capability, and that is using a C++ compiler using the C++ 17 standard. So we're going to retrieve this result that we've compiled and as you see two executables have come down 
we will discuss the second executable which is actually listed first we'll discuss that later suffice it to say uh, we have both programs here and this is a great opportunity to run the test program with the help parameter as you can see similar to other Linux Unix command line programs you run a help listing is output that explains the parameters that you can use and gives an indication of um, how they may be useful when running the program. This is not a program that is the intent of this test program is for you to explicitly specify the parameters relevant to the testing. And you'll notice that some of the parameters do take values such as the RSS feed name and the RSS URL. When you use the get RSS parameter, you'll notice that it attempts to issue a connection to a website and in this case that attempt was done in error therefore we have a logical bug rather than a technical bug and one way to get a handle on this technical bug I'm sorry this logical bug is through the use of the debugger and so GDB is here to allow us insight into the actual program in its compiled form. And we use the run um, command and supply arguments to the run command so that it executes the program similar to how we did when we executed it normally. So we're going to print out a few variables and examine them to understand where things may have gone askew. And right up front, the HTTP feed info good variable should actually be false. So we need to investigate the reasons for this and make the adjustments necessary. Hopefully, it does not take us very long to get to the bottom of why the program is giving the incorrect error condition or the incorrect condition of, of success. And the culprit is right there in the validate feed info missing function starting at line 39. So the error is more of a semantic issue. What is the name of the function? Validate feed info is missing. However, that was not the original name of the function. And so the variables in the body of the function were never changed. So the function was refactored. The function name was changed but now we have the variables matching the meaning of the function and it required flipping the values so false is true and true is false and so once the validation function executes it's going to show that if the feed name is empty or the URL is empty then is missing is true and the variable HTTP feed info is good is looking for is missing equal to false. So we recompile the result. So we send the code up, we build it, and we get the updated version of the executable and see where we're at. And true the form, the use of makefile has cut down on our 
we compile considerably. Let's do a directory listing just to see where we're at with things. And so we have a number of object files that were output both in the compile of the program called news download and RSS IO test. You'll see that bake file sets up a condition where library object files they're named according to the main executable and I would probably change bake file a little bit in the future if I was maintaining it to actually output object files without the uh, prefix. That way multiple bake files can generate similar object files and the program then can uh, speed up comp compilation even more. Anyway, so let's uh, do another test and see where we are with things. One of the things I'm curious about at this moment is seeing what is in the bin directory. What are the dates? How do things match up? Based on the get script, we have new versions of news download and RSS tests. We've run the updated version of the program and it has given the proper result. The data input values are in error. We do not accept a blank feed name or a blank feed URL depending on the flag that's passed in. The error message at the tail end that you see that is um, a method I've contrived based off of the R table example. So we see that the second branch executed, the else clause, the else branch executed, and it executes when there's an error in this case. And so the R table code uses go-to's. So when there's an error, you go to an error label and things get cleaned up and the program exits. Well, uh, the C++ compiler that I'm using uh, does not uh, smile kindly on go-to's, though it could be convinced to accept them. And I decided to keep things the way they are and I made a C++ friendly version of the um, cleanup and exit that maintained the spirit of what the uh, R table example demonstrated but at the same time made things uh, fit in a C++ context. So here I'm going to add a diagnostic message to better inform users of this executable what occurs when inputs are missing.
depending on your point of view, the verbose flag can either be seen as a opportunity to express error messages of a more detailed level, of a more detailed nature, or you could simply say you're always going to show detailed error messages and all the verbose flag does is show not more detailed error messages but more diagnostic data than you normally would express. So we've made some small changes. Let's send it up, compile it, build it, get the new result, and run it. You'll notice that I don't use a script for running the executable since it involves arguments, command line arguments. And you see we have our additional text. The reason I did that is I decided not to take the time to amend the scripts so that they would accept command line arguments, but you could adjust the scripts to accept whatever command line arguments are supplied to the script and then the script can forward it on to the command line. Um, to the executable. Here we're going to run the um, executable with the get RSS flag and properly fill in the relevant entries for feed name and URL. And we can use our reference text file for the valid values we need in this process. And so we see that the program ran, there's no connection, and it did attempt to go out to um, the network and retrieve the data, but the result was there was no data to be retrieved. there is one problem and that is that um, a flag is missing from the program and the absence of that flag ensures that you'll always have an error message and thus the program will, will return a error code but before we resolve that let's just run this with a live network connection and as you can see, we get data downloaded. The curl library is indicating that it was able to initiate a connection over the network and retrieve the information. And the the response that the response headers that it received indicated that everything was okay. So this is a good opportunity to compare the new XML file that was downloaded. And we see that the structure is the same, the contents are different. And while we're here, this is also a good opportunity to run our regular command line program. And we're going to get to a point where we download the data from multiple feeds using the same program. So during this process we'll stay connected to the Internet in order to facilitate this process. And you'll note that when we ran the help parameter it showed us that we do have an option call HTTP DB only. What that parameter means is the feed name and URL that's supplied will 
be used to access data at that network address and the database will be populated with that information. We have just ran it and sure enough we got a successful response from the network and from the server in this case and we have retrieved data and converted that data into a form that hopefully now exists in a database. So I have turned off the connection and in this case that is very useful to us in that many websites, many web operators frown on too frequent access to their servers and so you want to make sure you are respectful of their preferences on um, access frequencies, on frequent access. And one of the things I've str strove to do in this process is to um, address that. So SQLite allows you to um, list the tables in a database. So we're running the SQLite command line on the database that was created, the RSS database that was created. And we get to, we did ran a select statement that showed us that we um, have one entry in the database. And that's great. And there is a, another command called schema. And schema allows us to see the create table statement that was initially issued to define the table. And in this case, we can insert the names of different RSS feeds and their associated URLs so that we can use the self-update parameter of this command line program to automatically query the database for the relevant feed names and URLs and consequently execute a download for each one and update the database. So that was a massive dump of information and I'm not sure anyone else wants to see that again. So we can do a select where we use the limit clause to bring back only the, uh, the number of records we uh, would like to see. So we know that the database is successfully created by this process and we can now use that to help us understand how the GUI application might be better built. But before we get there, one of the things that we want to look at is basically understanding how the data copying, the data download and data induction process works. So we're going to create a custom script and this custom script what it will do is allow us to specify the command line to each to an instance of the news download executable and we will call the um, we'll call this for each one for each RSS feed that we're interested in when we run the script it will be as if the self update parameter was executed But 
self-update only applies when you have a live network connection. What we're going to do in this instance is we're going to take the XML files we have already downloaded and we're going to simply use those as the basis for creating content in the database. And one of the reasons for doing that, again, is to better manage time spent on a network and again to um, not run a file of the preferences site operators have for how often um, processes access those websites. And so this is a good way to get as close as possible to that ideal process. And then once we're sure the code works well, then we can um, take the next step of connecting live and running the program against a live connection. But first, we've identified some issues with our XML DB scenario that we need to resolve. Some of them would seem to indicate that the RSS feed names and URLs that we're supplying are, are not present, but we need to be absolutely certain about that. So we're going to go into the debugger and better understand the execution of the code in relation to the command line arguments supplied. This was the error I was referring to earlier where we were missing a flag and so it was creating a false positive in the result and more than likely it was um, causing the overall process to abort prematurely. So let's see if that's the case. So I'm going to set a breakpoint on um, a few lines when debugging you want to approach debugging in as strategic a manner as possible. And line 240 is the line that we're particularly interested in. So that's the line of code that should execute when things are going well. We're going to print out a few variable names just to confirm that we have valid values. And so far, everything is looking good. We have valid values for our command line argument, indicating which scenario we want to enter into. We have a valid pointer for the uh, string data. And when we dereference that pointer, we see that we actually have a valid text value. So, so far everything looks to be in place. So it's merely an issue of setting flags inappropriately. And once that is addressed, the program 
will run the way we expect. So here we go. And if you look on the left-hand side, gedit seems to be going a little crazy, but that's just UI feedback. It's giving us feedback that some data has changed. A file has changed in this case. And in this case, it's showing us RSSDB. And there are all the entries that our script generated. And then what about the data? So, in this case, if things ran the way we expect, we'll have more data um, than we'll know what to do with in terms of um, viewing it on the screen. And so, we'll get this massive dump of data that we'll want to, um, in this case, limit. So, there's our first record of result. We'll see that all the columns are in order, but it would be helpful to just list the feed names and um, other um, short information rather than you know the content. So, so here is a query that we can do with just the feed name and the headline, and this is a really good query. And so the program is currently designed to present everything, but if there was ever a need for optimization, this would be one easy optimization to do in terms of uh, truncating what is brought back from the database.